Hey guys, and welcome to Functional Print Friday, and welcome back to my shop. So where we left off was, last week I was unable to get this part to print, or really unable to get it to stick to the bed, in the PA6 nylon with carbon fiber in it, which is so weird because this one stuck to the bed just fine, but I was able to get this print to complete successfully, and actually it looks amazing. Uh, part and thanks to all the wonderful comments that you guys left for me from last week's video. So we'll be checking that out a bit later in the video and I'll explain how I got this to print and also how I got to this design. But first, let's get this piece mounted back up to the machine, get this mounted to the machine and start indicating this in because this has to run true on the cross slide of the lathe before we can proceed forward. Okay, we've got a bit of an interesting challenge here in that we need this piece, once it's mounted up, to run exactly true with the cross slide when the cross slide goes back and forth. So we're gonna set up an indicator here and the indicator will be stationary, but this piece will move back and forth. And if it's perfect, the indicator should basically stay on zero. The challenge is most of our adjustment is in this piece from these two machine screws, and this is gonna cover those once it's in place. So I think what I'm gonna do is get this piece to run as true as I can. Um, we'll indicate that in and then snug these up, mount this, and I'm hoping we'll have enough adjustability in this guy to get the top of this to run perfectly true to the axis. Okay, so this is bouncing all around because we're not riding on, you know, a clean surface. We're riding on that bottom edge that's 3D printed. So actually the fact that it's only moving around by, I think maybe I saw, I don't know, 3,000 there. That's actually not bad, but we're very close. So at the end of this travel, we're at zero. And at the end of travel in the other direction, we're zero. I'm going to check it one more time. It does dip down a little bit in the middle. That's not surprising. This piece is probably warped just a little bit from our cutout here. Probably just cooled a little bit unevenly. So right at the end of travel, it jumps a little bit. I think this is probably lifting on the dovetails, but if I back off of that, so we're right, we're at, mm, maybe a quarter of a thou there. And they, there we are now, we're about, mm, I think that is half a thou. So we're like three quarters of a thou off we should have that much adjustability in the bolts on this guy here. I might, you know what? I'm going to attempt to fade and I'm going to try and nudge it just a little bit too far. Yeah. See, that's the problem. Now the other end might have moved as well. Uh, all right. So we are, I'm going to average that and call that zero at the end of travel. Let's check the other side again. Yeah, so at this end of travel, we are still maybe just a hair over zero in that direction, in that clockwise direction, but we're really, really close. So I'm gonna snug these down and then I'm gonna check it one more time. All right, I think that still looks good. We're still kind of averaging around zero on either side. So this long part here is gonna mount onto this here. This reed head is actually gonna be stationary. This reed head and these, these red pieces here are just, uh, this is what it ships with. This holds it in the exact position away from this because this otherwise kind of floats a little bit and could end up in not in the position you want it without these in place when you install it. And these do not wrap all the way around the back so that we can actually get this all the way up on this rail uh, with these guys still installed. Now we have to be careful that we don't uh, get it past the end here without sliding this guy back and forth. But this essentially, these hold this in the correct position so that we can now mount this to this part of the casting down here. The problem is this sits up substantially higher than these pads down here on the casting. So we need to find a way to bridge the gap from this surface down here on the casting up to 
either these threaded holes on the bottom or these through holes here on the side. And the, it has to be held very stable on there because again, this piece is stationary. This piece, well, this piece is essentially stationary too relative to the cross slide. This piece is gonna be stationary relative to the carriage so that when the cross slide moves back and forth, this reads how far back and forth we're going, which will ultimately determine the diameter of the material that we're cutting here on the lathe. So I had to figure out what was the distance from these rough faces here on the casting up to this face here, and then figure out uh, the distance from this face here to the center line of this guy. And I aimed for hitting these holes down here because see how high we are? We're way above those pads. So I figure if we go straight into these pads, we can come up into the bottom of these guys. We also need to figure out how to stop this tailstock from running into all of our parts over here because previously, before any of this was here, the tailstock would essentially just run into the cross slide. Actually, I don't know if it would hit the cross slide or the casting down here first. Probably, yeah, I think it would actually hit the cross slide. Not great, but not the end of the world. I mean, that's a nice solid machined face um, and this is fairly flat here on the front. But now that we're gonna have this guy here and then ultimately the cover over this, I don't wanna slam this into it because this is quite heavy. So when you're sliding it, it's got a lot of mass. It's got a lot of energy. It would be like hitting this with a hammer. Clearly we don't wanna do that because hammers and precision don't mix. So I also needed to find a way with our bottom piece, because again, that's the piece that's stationary relative to the carriage to stop this from slamming into it. Because I know sooner or later, I'm gonna be pushing this down into position and it's gonna slide a little easier than I think for whatever reason, and I'm gonna hit that. So I really thought this piece was gonna be super easy to design, which is why I didn't even record the design process. And here was my first attempt. And I'll say, even on the first attempt, uh, the actual position of our important faces, which is this face back here that mounts against the casting, and this face up here, which is the one that is, goes up against the bottom of the reed head, they're in the right place. The problem is the whole thing is just way too big. It didn't have clearance for everything else kind of down there uh, up against the side of the carriage. And you can see the basic way that this is going to work is our bolts come in from the bottom and go up into the underside of the reed head, and then our bolts come in from this side uh, and go into the face of that casting on the cross slide. Got a little closer with the second one, uh, still too big. Really started to get close here, but you see now I start trying to fine tune in our hole over here to hold some kind of a bumper for that tailstock. And really everything from this point forward is just me making very small iterations, uh, working with the tight clearances around the different faces of that casting until I got to this point. This is essentially the final design and it's just printed in PLA. So let me walk over to the machine and I'll show you what I mean. Okay, so here's the casting that we need to mount against. So this guy is gonna come down here like this and we're gonna to have to drill two holes in this face down here for this guy to go into. And then the top face here is what goes against the bottom of the reed head on our DRO and those bolts need to come in from uh, the bottom of this part. Uh, our four holes up here are actually just clearance for some screws that are a little bit long in the reed head. If we look at the bottom of the reed head, it's got like a cover that comes off and these screw heads all stick up past that. And I wanted to, uh, my reference face, I wanted to be this flat surface, not kind of how hard the part presses into these screw heads. And you can see our bumper here is, the, the idea is this slides in this piece. It's a very loose slip fit so that once this is in place, we just push this back until it makes contact with the face of the casting here. And then it sticks out just enough that if our tailstock comes down, it's going to hit that TPU bumper before it hits any of the stack up of parts here for the DRO. And this has, I went through a couple different iterations of this as well until I got one with kind of just the right amount of squish. But I'll demonstrate that to you guys when we get, uh, when we get everything installed here. So our final part is basically exactly this, but printed in our PA6 nylon with carbon fiber. So let me grab that one and we'll get it attached to the bottom of the reed head. Because the trick here is I can't drill the holes for these two bolts to go into until I know exactly where this goes. And I won't know exactly where this goes until it is actually bolted to the bottom of the reed head and held in place. 
You'll see what I mean. Okay, now we need to make sure that the top face of this is running parallel to our direction back and forth. Now, this does not have to be perfect at this stage because this read head actually can be out by a little bit. So at this point, we're really trying to now just figure out where our holes get drilled here. So we'll have a little bit of adjustability up here. Once these pieces are off, this read head has the ability to kind of float around a couple degrees in each direction and up and down. Uh, we just want to be really close to where these red pieces of plastic hold it. So I'm going to check the top of this. We have a limited amount of travel because this guy is hard to slide. And I'm afraid just pushing it might actually knock things out of whack as well. So I'm going to indicate just a little bit here in the middle. Make sure it seems like it's running reasonably true. And then we're going to uh, set up to drill our holes down here. Because now with this guy in place, we know where those holes actually need to go into the casting down here. All right, that's running pretty much perfect now, at least perfect enough for us to actually get our holes uh, drilled down here in the bottom piece. Okay, I've got it lined up as good as I can to where each one of these holes should fall on, um, you know, an equal distance away from the edge of the pad um, on the casting down here. And I've got myself a four millimeter transfer punch. So what I'm gonna do now is just put this in each one of these holes and then tap this with a hammer and hopefully transfer the position of those holes onto the casting so that we can get in here and drill it. And if you're wondering how on earth I am going to drill these when it is uh, that close up here to the surface of the ways, yeah, so was I, but I think I have that part figured out, at least I think. Okay, now we have successfully transferred the location of those holes to these two points down here on this casting. And look how close this one is to the surface of our ways here. That's the one that's gonna be the trickiest to drill, but let me show you guys what I came up with. So I picked up a three pack of these super tiny little drill chucks that have a hex on the back. And I'll link this in the description below. And the other component to this is just a standard right angle adapter for uh, a quarter inch impact. Actually, I don't think this thing is rated for an impact. I think it's just for drill use. You'd probably eat it up pretty quick using it on an impact. I'll link to this specific one as well. Years ago, I needed this for another job and I bought like three different types of these right angle adapters. The DeWalt one was by far the best, but because we have uh, a hex input on this side, well, actually that side doesn't matter, but the output is hex. We can pop one of these really tiny hex drill chucks in here and this turns to close these jaws. Uh, just have to actually lock the hex on the other end, otherwise we're, we're turning the whole thing. And then we'll turn this end in the drill. So this crazy stack up should give us the ability to get in there, let me show you. Yeah, so it's really close, but this head is so thin uh, that if I've got this right up against there, yeah, it's close, but it actually looks like we have probably about a whopping two to three millimeters of room to spare with this guy in position. So this should do it. The other obvious alternative is we could take the entire carriage off the lathe and then take it over to the milling machine, but it is a significant task to remove the entire carriage from the lathe. So, I mean, if we can drill it in place, that's what I'd like to do. 
All right, I'm gonna leave you guys all the way back over here in the tripod so that I've got plenty of room to work over here because I'm gonna to need to get my head down here and be able to see what I'm doing to you know, try and keep this drill bit straight with that whole crazy contraption of parts. First thing I'm gonna do is enlarge the size of those holes a little bit. I'm just gonna come in with a standard punch and just get right in the center of those holes and make those a little bit bigger. And then we'll probably start with a center drill uh, on each one of these and then switch to like a pilot bit and then our final finish size uh, Our final finish tap size uh, For this and then we'll get these tapped and I made up a couple different blocks to try and keep things straight that I'm I, I think I'm gonna try and use but I just don't know that it's actually gonna make it any easier than just eyeballing it But we'll see. I'll speed this part up This thing is just starting to get a little bit warm. I can feel it warming up here at the, uh, there's probably like a bevel gear here in the end, but still doing okay. It's actually working out better than I thought it would. Okay, and this is now our tap size drill, which is 3.3 millimeters, which is the right diameter for a hole tapped for M4. Okay, now we have a starting tap, a taper tap, and a plug tap. I'm gonna go through each one of these with a little bit of anchor lube in those holes. Freehand, again, because there's just no good way to perfectly line these up. Although, I do have a lot of reference points with my eye. I'm above this and I'm able to kind of set my vertical and uh, horizontal position by just all of the different uh, straight flat surfaces. I mean, it's not perfect, but I think they're pretty close. This is another trick tool that is invaluable for this type of thing. So this is a tap driving set from Lyle. I'll link this down in the description as well. There's all these different sizes because they accommodate all different size taps. And the way these work is they all have uh, just a regular square drive in the back that you use with you know, a ratchet or whatever else. And they're sized so that the square end of the tap actually drops down in there. And there's either, an, I think there's just a couple O-rings in here that hold it in place because it's got kind of like a nice soft feel and then you line up the uh, square and it drops down a place and now we can drive this tap from anything that we can drive with a regular uh, in this case quarter inch uh, square drive and i'm going to drive this with just a regular quarter inch ratchet and i've added myself an extension here not because i need the reach but just to give my eye something more to visually just try and keep straight so wish me luck All right, well that looks pretty good. I would say they look pretty darn straight for being drilled and tapped freehand. 
What we don't know yet is if we still have the correct distance between these or if something moved in the process of all that drilling and tapping. So let me get our PLA piece and see if it actually bolts up on this hole spacing. Well guys, I was holding my breath as I brought this guy up here to see if those uh, bolts both went in and they both go in, no problem. In fact, I can spin them freely between my thumb and forefinger uh, once I break them loose. So I think our angle has gotta be pretty darn close as well. Cause if we were, you know, if we were wonky by, you know, even more than, I don't know, two or three degrees, uh, the bolt would be rubbing on the bore of this piece and, you know, wouldn't come in or out easily, but everything is nice and smooth and free. So I think we can move on to the real one. All right, but before we do that, how did I finally get this thing to successfully print? Because if you guys remember from last week, I was saying that even though our much longer print with, I thought, smaller surface area uh, stuck just fine, I could not get this short piece with plenty of surface area to stick to the build plate. I tried a brim, I tried no brim, I tried a bigger brim. And interestingly enough, the one with the bigger brim actually came off the build plate first. It seemed like that brim would peel up first and then the whole thing would come off, but it didn't stick with no brim either. And guys, the answer was as simple as just following the directions on Bamboo Lab's website that says to use the bamboo glue stick. It says recommended bamboo glue stick. Now, in my defense, in the eight years I've been 3D printing where somebody has said for you know x filament on y machine you have to use a glue stick i have never actually had to use a glue stick particularly on the textured pei sheets everything has just stuck um, i've never had to use a glue stick is as either a you know a glue to actually help an adhesion or as a release agent to help uh, release the material i've always gotten away without using the glue stick i guess Nylon is my nemesis, at least on a PEI sheet. But you guys had a ton of great suggestions in the comments, and many of you actually suggested the glue stick as well, which is really what got me to take another look at the Bamboo site and see what they said. So let's go take a look at those comments. All right, I'm sure there's a bunch of great comments in here, but let's just focus on the ones that talk specifically about the build surface. So let's guess I just uh, Garolite. Uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, G10, best surface for any nylon. Uh, I did a little bit of a Google on this stuff. I guess there isn't really a build plate available for the bamboo printers that is made of this Garolite material yet, but I think something is coming out soon. Uh, yeah, he mentions Lightyear. It seems to me that this company uh, is either already offering or will be offering soon a build plate for uh, the bamboo series printers, which I will probably be checking out. Um, and he's saying no adhesive at all, just clean with IPA. Yeah, okay. Yep, this guy mentions the glue stick. So, yep, good call. Ended up totally just being the glue stick, as many of you guys uh, suggested. Adhesion could be nozzle wear issue if you purchased the material. No, the nozzle's in good shape. Printer doesn't, I mean, I use the printer a decent amount, but it doesn't have a ton of hours, and it is the hardened steel nozzle. And in fact, we had just switched to the 0.6 millimeter nozzle, so. This was, I think, literally the second print that got done on that nozzle. Uh, washing the build plate with actual Dawn dish soap solve. Yeah, so, you know, it's funny. Years ago, I used to heavily advocate for doing an IPA wipe and then a Windex wipe. Actually, or did I do the Windex first? I think I did Windex first on a, just a, a you know, a paper towel, would wipe the bed with that and then follow that up with 99.99% IPA, the really pure expensive stuff. And I swore by that. And I eventually tried the Dawn dish soap, uh, just hot water and Dawn dish soap and like a scrubby at the sink. And yeah, that works way better. That's pretty much how I maintain my uh, textured PEI sheet. So if you're buying uh, expensive IPA and a bunch of other stuff to try and clean your sheets, yeah, I, I know Dawn dish soap sounds so simple, uh, but it really is the best solution. It unfortunately did not work for this. That was the first thing I did when I was having adhesion issues is I took that sheet up and scrubbed it really good with uh, hot water and just plain old Dawn dish soap and it made no difference at all. Um, I have never tried this stuff. Uh, that might be worth uh, 
checking out at some point. Again, this is one of those things that I see regularly suggested for uh, build plate adhesion problems. And up to this point, I just, I really haven't had adhesion problems. See, this person mentions the Vision Miner stuff as well on a smooth PEI sheet. I don't think I have any smooth PEI sheets uh, that, are, that fit the bamboo. Glue stick, yep, absolutely. That ended up being it. Um, painter's tape. Uh, I think somebody else mentioned painter's tape as well. I'll come back to that. Let's see, clean the PI plate with IPA and it will stick better than ever. Uh, I mean, okay, I guess to be fair, I did not try IPA in this case. I just gave up on it a while ago when it seemed like Dawn just did a much better job. I don't know, maybe IPA would have made a difference in this instance. I see it's got four thumbs up. Let's see, layer near bed weld. Never heard of that. Apparently it is literal magic though. Uh, spraying the bed with hairspray. I've heard of that years ago as more of a release agent. Uh, but again, I know glue stick gets used as a release agent um, for a lot of filaments on different machines as, as well. So maybe hairspray also would have solved the adhesion issues with this, I'm not sure. Uh, see this person suggesting, I don't know what that is. I've never heard of that before. Um, but prepping the surface, use some high grit sandpaper. So yeah, I don't know that I would do this on, well, I take that back. I, I actually have done this, um, not sandpaper, but what I've done is like uh, steel wool, like the triple zero steel wool. I haven't had to do it on the bamboo sheets, but on the textured PEI sheet for my Prusa that came from Prusa, I found that sheet to be just too slippery from the factory. And it depends on the sheet. I've actually got several of them. Some of them, the texture is fine. Other sheets with the same part number, I had to hit them with steel wool and then wash them really good with Dawn dish soap to get uh, parts to reliably stick. So I don't know that I'd go taking sandpaper to your sheet, even though 300 to 400 is a fairly high grit. Um, I would go with the, the triple zero or the, the uh, quadruple zero steel wool. See, this person suggests uh, tweaking the temperatures a bit, and I see another mention of rubbing alcohol. I did actually try dropping the temperature on a suggestion that I saw on a Reddit thread for the nylon filament. Um, it made no difference for me. I didn't go higher, uh, to be fair. And we got another one for just thoroughly washing and glue stick. Bamboo Lab glue in the bottle. Um, I've not, I'm not familiar with that stuff. I'm assuming that's different than the glue stick that gets included with the machine, which is actually what I ultimately ended up using. Uh, let's see, PEI, gold PEI service, you can acetone to clean it. PEI is not affected by acetone. I don't think that's true. I think acetone does actually soften uh, PEI. I think it'll stand up to it for a while, but I believe acetone does actually affect PEI. Let me know down in the comments if you guys have tried that. Um, I'm not, CDs make stuff, I'm not calling you a, a liar. I've, I've not actually tried acetone on the bed. I just, I remember reading that acetone does soften the PEI. Uh, so you don't wanna do it all the time, but you can do it on occasion. And I remember reading that back when I was having uh, adhesion issues on the, some of the PEI sheets that I'd gotten from Prusa and I was gonna try acetone after trying steel wool if uh, steel wool didn't get the, the, uh, the surface up to sort of the right roughness for, for stuff to stick. Uh, what build plate did you use to print PEI? Yeah, so I was using the, it's just the, the plain old textured PEI uh, bamboo branded sheet. Uh, glass bed, I don't know, maybe. Um, I'll come back to that too uh, when I get to, I think what is the last comment on uh, the blue painter's tape. Uh, glue stick, uh, well, I, I did eventually, and that's what got at the stick. Uh, here's a mention of the bamboo engineering build plate. I did consider that, um, but ultimately I tried the glue stick first on the textured PEI sheet, and that did a wonderful job. Like it stuck really good to the textured PEI sheet after I did the, the glue stick. Let's see, I'm not an expert in it, but wash down build plate with Dawn, wipe off build plate with IPA. Yeah, I don't, I, don't know, I don't know if there's really a benefit to wiping down the bill plate with IPA after you wash it with, with Dawn. I've, I've just not had to use, at least for other materials. Again, to be fair, maybe it will make a difference with nylon, but for PLA, PETG, ABS, all the other filaments that I typically use, once I switched to using just real hot water and a good scrub with Dawn, um, I haven't had to use any other chemicals uh, with the exception of the glue stick for this print.
Another mention of Vision Miner and Blue Tape. Uh, 3D LAC, I think we saw a mention of that before. Another mention of the engineering plate. And you never heard of masking tape. So I, I said I'd come back to this one. So there was a couple suggestions of masking tape. Somebody mentioned uh, glass as well. So the challenge to these suggestions is I'm printing this on the Bamboo Labs uh, X1C. And it might be possible to code an offset into the sheet. I've never tried it. Uh, the the trick with that machine, and it's uh, it's a, I guess it's a, it's it has its pros and cons. The the pros to working within the Bamboo Labs ecosystems is it just everything just works. If you, it reads the uh, the build plate that's on there. You select the build plate. Like every, I just you you don't have to mess with offsets. Uh, like I have offsets saved for all the different build plates that I have for my. Uh, my Prusa printer as an example. And in fact, all I print with on my ANET A8 that's heavily modded is masking tape. That was pretty much the go-to surface back when I first got into 3D printing uh, eight years ago. I just, I, you know, every 10 or so prints on that machine, I peel off the, the tape. It's just a bare sheet of aluminum is the bed on that machine. And then I just put masking tape over top of it. And masking tape may very well work. The challenge is, because you're in that sort of ecosystem with using all the Bamboo Lab stuff, if you put something on the build plate that raises the surface, I don't think that it is going to properly level the bed. Uh, let me know down in the comments if you guys have tried that. Maybe it'll work. I don't, I don't know. I, I'm actually, I'm pretty interested to hear because I, I do use masking tape on my uh, Prusa Mark III on occasion. Uh, like, for example, if I want that texture, sort of that flat texture that you get with a masking tape um, for TPU or even for, for PLA. But I have not tried adding anything on top of the build plate surface when printing on the Bamboo Labs machines because I just don't want to mess with going in there and trying to, like, override some sort of offset for the, uh, the thickness or height of the plate. Thank you guys so much for all the comments that you guys left on last week's video. There is, it's just like a little gold mine down here of suggestions for uh, bed adhesion. And you know, a lot of these apply to filaments other than the, uh, the PA6 nylon as well. So you guys were super helpful in, you know, helping me try the glue stick on that bed. And uh, hopefully uh, other folks that are looking at this video in the future and having bed adhesion problems can get some ideas from down here as well. But uh, let's get back to it and install that new piece. Okay, I cranked the carriage down out of the way. I'm going to get the masking tape off of here, wipe off these surfaces because we probably have cast iron dust, which is abrasive still here in places. Get this all cleaned up and then I'm going to indicate this in off camera because I'm sure you guys don't need to watch me do that again. Well, it's hard to be upset about that. I think at most I see maybe a tenth of movement. This is a, a, a half thou uh, incremented gauge and I'm really, I mean, I'm seeing the needle move just a tiny bit, but that could even just be the surface finish on the aluminum. So I think I'm going to go with that. All right, I think that looks pretty good. You see our bumper sticking out, and at first thought it might be sticking out a little bit far, but I think that's probably good because that guy is gonna compress if we do actually manage to drive, particularly drive the carriage into the tailstock. I don't think we're gonna compress it that much pushing the tailstock into it, let's just see. Yeah, it's definitely stopping it before we get to our cover. But watch this, I bet you if I lock the tailstock and we drive the carriage into the tailstock, yeah, I can actually, uh, I'm turning the handle down here pretty hard, but I can actually take it all the way until 
the cover touches it. But there's no way that I'd do that without realizing, you know, that I've come up against something. Okay, around the back here, there's plenty of room for the wire to come through here in this little armor. But I think we're going to need to attach it here with probably just a little cable loop uh, to sort of keep it in that position so it doesn't work its way over. Because if it gets all the way over under the edge of the guard, then it will catch. But as long as it's over here, there's plenty of room. So let me drill and tap a hole here and just add a little wire clamp. All right, I went ahead and drilled this and tapped it M3 and put a small rubber cable clamp there that's holding this guy nicely in place in the right position so it doesn't rub here on the cover. And I went and zip tied all of our cables together all the way back across the coolant hose and down here to the end. I've just got the touch DRO box just sort of sitting over here for now. Eventually, I'm probably going to make a piece uh, that mounts everything down to this end of the lathe. But there's a couple things I still wanna do on here in the future, at least not anytime soon. I do wanna add a Hall effect sensor on the spindle for this so that I have an RPM readout for this machine as well. There's a table here on the front that shows you approximately what the RPM is depending on which gear that you are in, but I'm sure that's not exactly accurate. And Touch DRO does have the ability to calculate the feed rate if it knows the RPM. I have 155 plugged in there just to test it, but normally what will happen is if you have like auto feed engaged, as long as it knows what the RPM is, it'll give you the feed rate. But right now it's just calculating that based on the manual RPM that I've plugged in. It'd be cool if I could actually see the RPM live and it would calculate that for the feed rate. So I think at this point, everything is done with this at this point. We've got the stop on here. We created the mount pieces for uh, the rail up here as well as the head down here. We designed this piece here that clamps this extra brushed aluminum piece of tubing in. We designed this top piece here that holds the, the, uh, the phone in place, our touch DRO display. And we prototyped this piece back here with 3D printing and then ultimately cut it out of quarter inch thick aluminum plate just so that it is nice and stiff. And same thing for prototyping the pieces down here, the standoffs uh, that mount the reed head down here. So I think at this point, it's finally time to put the backsplash back on here and uh, actually give this a try and see if it works. So let me see if I can round somebody up to give me a hand in putting the backsplash back on this. All right, I just finished calibrating both of these scales in Touch DRO with some calibration blocks. So I think we're all set to test this. And I've got a piece of just aluminum round bar uh, chucked up here in the lathe. And what I wanna do is just try and make a test piece very roughly with this. So let's make a piece that is half an inch in diameter. We'll come in half an inch and have a step up to 0.6 inch uh, for our second diameter here. So really we're trying to hit this initial diameter uh, the depth of this step and then the diameter of this piece here. And I'm saying roughly because normally you would turn off your, you know, sort of your, your scale here on the, on the piece to make sure that it is running true in the lathe, measure the diameter with a micrometer, enter that figure into touch DRO, which we are going to do. You'll see me do that. And then as you get close to your final diameter, you'd stop, measure it again with a micrometer, and then enter that diameter into touch DRO so that uh, on your final cuts you get, you know, within, hopefully within tenths. I'm, I'm intentionally not going to do that. I'm going to pretend this is just a part that I'm making that, you know, I'd like to get within one thou uh, for tolerance. And I'm just going to measure the initial diameter and then just make my cuts until I get all the way to the uh, final diameter as displayed by the DRO. Same thing for uh, the step. Uh, we'll face off the end. We'll zero that. So we should be able to then get our half inch uh, depth to the step and then um, I'm not going to measure this, uh, this length here. Just we'll make this the 0.6 millimeter section deep enough that we can get a micrometer over it. So let's go. All right, I've got you guys in the tripod position where you can see both the display of touch DRO and the workpiece, which also means you don't have a great view of either one, but hopefully you have a good enough view to see what's going on.
All right, I'm just gonna break both of those corners so we can easily measure it, and then we will get our measurements. Okay, well, keen observers probably noticed that halfway through there, I actually stopped and switched the, uh, the X scale. It was inverted. So I was expecting to go to half an inch and I realized that it was inverted. So I just took it to one inch, which is still removing half inch of material from where our zero was. But then I fixed it for the 0.6 so that it was not reading inverted because that was confusing. So let's see how we did. All right, well, our first measurement is way off. This should be 0.5 and we are 0. Uh, 0.465. So we are, what is that, 35,000th off? Um, yeah, so I think our inverted scale on the, the DRO really, really messed us up on that one. We should still be able to measure the step though because I zeroed it back where we were at the 0. 0.5 or where when I thought we were at the 0. 0.5 and then cut the 0. 0.6. So we still should have exactly 100 thou between these two. So let's. Let's do that. Let's, I'm gonna put this on here. We'll put this in absolute. Now it's gonna measure the difference between that and this other one. All right, that is a lot better. So that is, this reads uh, an entire extra digit more than the DRO does. So we are only one tenth of a thousand off. That's really good. Uh, I guess there's a reprieve here. Well, you know what? Let's measure our step first before we do anything else. I'm just gonna do this with a digital caliper. So you can see we are zeroed here. Yeah, we're pretty much right on with that. Looks like we are um, up to 5 tenths off, but that's also the resolution of these calipers. So I'm calling that good. We really screwed up that first diameter because our scale was inverted. Uh, let's take a crack at saving it. So we are, I think we're what, at 460? Let's try and turn this. I'm gonna measure that again. I'm gonna enter that measurement into the DRO to tell it where we are, and we'll try and take it to 400 thou. Okay, so the actual diameter of this piece right now that we just skim cut is uh, four five four five five so we'll enter that in the touch DRO okay and there's we have one more digit on here than we do on here so it's just rounded it up There we go, that is a lot closer. It looks like we overcut that by about half a thou, about, about five tenths, which honestly is not bad. Again, normally and when you get close to your measurement, you would take another measurement and then only move in the required amount. We came down to three, actually, yeah, we came down to 399, so yeah, we're, we're within half a thou. Well guys, as always, thanks for hanging out in the shop with me for this week's video, and special thanks to those of you that actually watched all of the videos in the series of me installing the DRO on this lathe. It was really quite the journey. You could see quite a few iterations and trials and tribulations of different pieces here, learning that I just needed to use the glue stick for the nylon in particular. And, you know, it's not lost on me that I'm probably one of the few people on earth that could somehow manage to take three weeks to install a DRO on a lathe. Uh, most people probably would do this in an afternoon and, you know, it, uh, there would have been a whole lot of it's good enough along the way. And that's just not how I operate. Uh, I really didn't want to make any compromises in this install and I don't think I did. You know, every single hole was drilled in the right place. I feel like I thought through where, you know, the best way to mount each piece. Uh, we, we thought through several different improvements on a lot of the different parts that we designed. I mean, this part alone, this is a perfect example. I thought this was going to be a dead simple, pretty much rectangular chunk of material. And it ended up being quite complex to get everything to be exactly what I wanted. But, you know, I'm really happy to step back from the lathe and uh, see everything installed on there exactly as we planned it out. So... If this is by chance your first time on the channel, I do a new functional print every single Friday. A lot of them are out here in the shop. We do some machining as well, uh, but I do stuff outside and around the house as well. If you're into that sort of thing, check out some of my other videos. And if you like what you see, hit that subscribe button. And guys, if you do, 
I'll see you next Friday.